the brand new EU AI Act came into force on the 1st of August. Will AI ever be the same? The Act is comprehensive, but how does it work and what does it mean? Can I still build, use, deploy AI apps in Europe? If you're interested in these questions, but you don't want to spend hours reading the Act, watching legal analysis, then this video is for you. I'm Adam Farquhar, and I am very much not a lawyer, but I am the founder of Digital Lifecycle Management, and my background is in helping archives, libraries, and cultural heritage organizations to understand and apply advanced technologies with a focus on AI and machine learning. This video is being created as part of the European Commission's e-archiving initiative, which provides specifications, software, training, and knowledge to help people store information for longer. This is the third video in the series. The second video is on the challenges to using AI in archives, and it touched very briefly on the Act. Since it came out, I've had several requests to review the Act in depth. So here is my not a lawyer summary. The Act sets up a risk-based framework. It categorizes AI systems into four different risk levels. First, there are unacceptable risk systems. These threaten EU citizens' fundamental rights, and systems in this category are generally prohibited. This includes systems that mislead and manipulate people, create scoring systems, or predict criminality based on behavior. Applications that do emotional recognition in the workplace or exploit someone's vulnerabilities based on age, disability, or social situations, those are also prohibited. And sometimes people joke that advertising should have been in this category, but I'm afraid that AI-driven adverts will still be very much a thing. Second, high-risk AI systems. So these have strong transparency obligations and require quite deep familiarity with the upcoming guidelines. This is where the real meat of the AI Act is sitting. Examples include systems that manage critical infrastructure like the power grid or work with university admissions or hiring. A good rule of thumb is that a system is high risk if it needs a third-party assessment before entering the EU market. For example, medical devices, industrial machinery, toys, cars, aircraft, and some educational systems already need review before you can sell them and are hence in this category. Until the guidelines are in place, though, there's going to be some confusion around exactly which applications are high risk. Third are the limited risk AI systems. These have modest transparency obligations. Users need to, for instance, know that a system is AI-based and have an option not to use it. Examples include a lot of the chatbots and many content-generating systems. We're seeing rapid improvement in voice, image, and video generation. It can already be impossible to tell if it's a person or an AI on the other end of that video call. Um, I'm very glad that this will have to be clearly called out. The fourth is those minimal risk AI systems. They have no obligations under the Act. Examples include AI-enabled video games or spam filters. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about whether these are the right sorts of categories. Um, I think they're okay, right? I like the focus on people and how systems impact them. Uh, this is much better than, for instance, trying to regulate rapidly changing technology. I like a lot of things about the Act. Uh, one of my least favorite bits, however, is its definition of AI. AI, according to the Act, is a machine-based system that is designed to operate with varying levels of autonomy and that can, for explicit or implicit objectives, generate outputs such as predictions, recommendations, or decisions that influence physical or virtual environments. So, like, I get it. Uh, I think that it will end up being just fine, but I personally, I hate phrases that have little meaning like implicit and explicit, physical or virtual, varying levels. Um, it's hard to define AI usefully, but there are better versions out there Right, AI is used to uh, 
It's a very broad concept. It lumps together a lot of different types of capabilities. Some systems perform tasks that make people think uh, really hard, right? Like writing a short story or summarizing a complex document. But others do tasks that seem very easy for us, ones that insects can do, and we don't typically think of insects as being very smart. The most recent addition to the Act was a separate section dedicated to general purpose AI models. The regulators were thinking about these powerful large language models, like the ones that sit behind ChatGPT, Claude, or Gemini. So companies spend tens of millions of euros to develop and train these models. Under the Act, they're going to have some additional obligations. For example, they'll need to respect EU copyright laws and provide detailed information about their training approach and the data that they use. It's not clear yet uh, but this could also apply potentially to organizations that fine-tune a large model. Some models are also taken to pose systemic risks. These are the ones that could have an impact on the EU market or negative effects on public health, safety, fundamental rights, or society as a whole. One of the ways that the Act identifies models that might pose a systemic risk is by the amount of compute that's used to train the model. Uh, it sets a threshold of 10 to the 25th floating point operations. Uh, if you need to use more than these, uh, you're going to have to register with the EU. But just for context, um, that would take me about 10,000 years on the GPU that I have in my workstation. It's somewhere between the effort required to train ChatGPT 3.5 and ChatGPT 4.0. Uh, using today's approaches, therefore, it's enough to create like a general purpose system, quite powerful, but with some substantial shortcomings. In addition, companies are going to need to document and report serious incidents and implement cybersecurity measures as well. The new EU AI Act became law when it was published in August 2024, but the rollout is staged over the next 36 months, so over a three-year period. Most provisions of the Act will apply after 24 months in August 2026, and ones uh, related, for instance, to prohibited AI systems, along with requirements for some employers around AI literacy, are going to apply after only six months in February of 25. The ones related to the foundation models and general purpose AI systems will apply after 12 months, as does the uh, quite important penalty scheme. For existing systems that are still in operation, there's going to be an extra grace period to bring them into alignment. Provisions related to the high-risk systems, somewhat surprisingly, will take 36 months before they come into effect, so that's August uh, 2027, but that makes sense given the level of regulation and precision with which you have to fulfill um, the requirements. The Act requires some quite tricky balancing. On the one hand, the EU wants to protect its citizens, and on the other, it wants to allow for innovation, investment, and growth. Uh, to help with this, there are some important exemptions to the Act. The biggest one of these exemptions is for scientific research and development. Uh, there is also one for systems developed for personal and non-professional activities. So I guess if I want to start that 10,000-year journey to develop a new foundation model, I'll probably be okay. Even research, testing, and development of AI systems or models prior to putting them onto the market is allowed, although you may have to do it in a laboratory or a simulated environment rather than on the you know, open web. There's one more provision that I think a lot of people are going to find super exciting. There's a major exemption for many low and moderate risk models or systems that are distributed for free and under open source licenses. So, yay open source. Along with the AI Act, there's another major change to EU legislation in the works updates to the EU Product Liability Directive, or PLD, and they are going to have as big an impact on AI-enabled systems as the AI Act is itself. So, like, stay with me here. Uh, this is important. Uh, the PLD provides the basis for a court to decide if a product is defective, and if it is, who has to pay damages caused by the defect? 
Uh, it supports what is known as strict liability or sometimes no fault liability. Under strict liability laws, if a product causes damage, the producer can be held liable even if they worked very hard to do everything right. Okay, plaintiffs just need to show there was a defect, they were harmed by it, and the product caused the damage. The PLD has been around for 40 years, uh, and up to now, it did not apply to, I can't believe I'm saying this, it did not apply to software. Like, seriously, software systems and services were not considered products. So sensibly, the EU is updating the PLD to make it fit for the digital age. And for the first time, it's going to cover software systems and services. And while the new PLD hasn't been published yet, the European Parliament endorsed it in March, and I expect that it will be formally published later this year. And whenever this happens, it will start to apply 24 months after that. So this is going to absolutely rock the software industry. I think there are five big changes uh, relevant to AI systems. The most important is that definition of product, which now includes software services and digital files. And companies that create or deploy software products are going to be, for the first time, having strict liability for damages that are caused. And second is the definition of damage has been broadened, uh, and it now includes psychological health. And I think that could mean that selling, for instance, addictive software uh, products could result in lawsuits which might not have happened previously. Failure to provide updates and address security cybersecurity issues um, is clearly labeled and will be considered a defect. Uh, it's quite an important change. The new PLD also applies to capabilities that a system might learn or acquire once it's on the market, and this will be super important for machine learning systems that adapt their behavior over time. With complex systems, strict liability has been pretty hard to prove. It requires showing the defect as well as the causality linking the defect to the damage. And proving causality often requires quite massive legal discovery combined with a deep technical expertise. And this meant, as a matter of practice, that many citizens have been unable to effectively bring lawsuits, even if we might say, well, they were harmed. Uh, the new PLD is going to address this by reducing the plaintiff's burden of proof. So once there's a plausible claim, the manufacturer is actually responsible and is just going to have to disclose the needed information in court. And if the manufacturer doesn't make the disclosure, the court can actually presume that the defect exists. Uh, if proving the causal link similarly is excessively complex, then the court can simply presume that that link exists. So. These changes are going to apply to all sorts of products, but I think it's obvious that they're going to have a huge impact on software and every interesting, at least, AI system. I think the new PLD will also have a big impact on how companies who provide and deploy software write their contracts. Everyone's going to try to control like how their products are used uh, and try to work to distribute the liability in a way that's not clear at the moment. I'll be blunt. As someone who uses software-enabled products and services, this seems like, you know, great stuff. I'm really glad that we're going to be able to hold manufacturers to task for damage that's done by software and services. As a software developer, however, it is terrifying. Um, I'm glad that we've got a couple of years to figure it out. Uh, we're going to need to think through how it will affect our practice and understand how to limit uh, and distribute the liability. When I first started learning about the EU AI Act, I read a lot of doom and gloom. Pundits predicted that it would destroy competition and hold Europe back. Uh, I disagree. I think that risk-based approach is flexible. It's not about technology. It's about how it's used. The types of systems in each category feel sensible. The obligations seem appropriate. We'll have to keep a close eye on the guidelines as they develop over the coming year, but the direction of travel, uh, for me, feels good. I think the exemptions uh, will help 
a lot to foster creativity, research, and innovation, the EU will also be funding some infrastructure to provide spaces for research and experimentation. The obligations on foundation model developers are, I think, pretty heavy, uh, but so is the risk and so is their investment. I've seen some reasonable feeling estimates that it might increase the cost of developing these models initially by around 10%, and this, this seems fair to me. I'm somewhat worried about the impact that the changes to the product liability directive will have on the European software market. I know that the EU wants to support innovation and market growth, so I have like some confidence that we'll all be able to find a way forward, but the first systems to be challenged under the new framework will be very interesting to watch. So what does this all mean for archives uh, that are thinking about developing or deploying AI-based systems? I think that the news here is positive. We will be almost without exception working with limited or minimal risk systems, and that means that our obligations under the Act will be modest. In practice, uh, these feel like obligations under GDPR. In other words, they can be mildly annoying to both end users and implementers. There will be some uncertainty as to whether you're absolutely doing it correctly, but really, in most cases, it won't be that much work to comply. And if you want to check your system's risk category, the Commission actually provides a really handy interactive tool, and I'll put the link down in the description. So my bottom line, complying with the new laws is going to be more an administrative than a technical burden. The EU AI Act is a huge deal, the new PLD is also a huge deal, um, but they're not going to get in our way. Uh, we can move ahead with our plans to use AI in archives. Now, I need to hear from you. How is the EU AI Act changing the way that you're thinking about deploying AI systems? Are you worried about that new PLD? How is your organization thinking about it? We're trying to make these videos informative, accessible, and valuable for our communities, so let me know what you've enjoyed and what you think we can do better. Use the comments or contact me at Digital Lifecycle Management. And if you found this video helpful, hit the like button. Uh, if you want to hear about the next one, hit subscribe and share these videos across your network. I'm looking forward to seeing you next time.